the end. I can compound by gripping the end. I can even compound by hitting the far side of his head or his body. So tracing and compounding, a very, very simple technique for increased precision, applying all of your power to the desired target, and also to ensure that we bypass any sort of psychological inhibitions that may be lurking there, and also reduce the risk of any post-traumatic stress or uh, discomfort after the fact. One of the most definitively Russian elements of Sistema is the um, aspect of Slavic boxing, or what is commonly termed fisticuffs. Slavic boxing was originally created as a uh, cultural, almost folk festival activity, and it was immediately intended for use against multiple attackers. As a result, there's a wide use of elliptical and figure eight motion so that we can address as many attackers as possible. Here we're only addressing the one solitary Anthony, so we're going to compress it down to a smaller range of motion. If we revisit the work that we did on previous DVDs, I had introduced the notion of a Slavic jab. And a Slavic jab is, rather than delivering simply a punch in, in, in sort of isolation and then following with a cross or working with the other hand, the basis of the Trinity strike is to see how I can use the same hand to deliver two shots. So normally we have those primary knuckles, whether we're striking with the first two or the bottom three, leading the way, the thumb is down, and then from that position, the elbow stays high as a defensive measure, and I corkscrew around so I can deliver a hammer fist. So with a hand, it's already devastating. And we remember, one of the key principles to improvise weapons is not to always rely on it. Just because I have it doesn't mean I need to stab. The reality is, a straight punch is probably going to deliver a lot more damage and be far more familiar and precise than some kind of bizarre, confused front stab with the pen. So I want it to be a natural extension of my motion, my jab into my hammer fist. And that's the beginning of the motion. We've already seen this in previous volumes. But from there, the notion of trinity striking is using the one arm to deliver three or more strikes and the reason for this is that if we look at a basic boxing combination lefts and rights lefts and rights working at most most people will operate on a single beat meaning they'll punch and retract punch and retract a more experienced person will operate on a half beat meaning that at the point of retraction, the second hand is already following. But it's very difficult in conventional two-dimensional boxing to get to a quarter beat. And a quarter beat can normally only be had by filling the gap between one hand and another in this manner. And so by using that Slavic jab, we immediately start filling in the gaps. A second reason we use the Trinity strike is that in situations of fear, oftentimes we're, we're, we're quite defensive. And you see people, sometimes un unskilled, slap fighting or trying to use one hand to keep the person away. So the Trinity strike allows us to use that single hand just to keep them at bay and to weaponize that posture. It's also very, very confusing to someone who's conventionally used to sort of shielding with, you know, against left-right attacks. So very common uh, combinations we'll see is that Slavic jab, that punch into a hammer, and then normally a sidestep into a Slavic hook. And a Slavic hook normally is not done with a tremendous amount of torque from the waist, but rather, the body, rather it's simply the flexion of the bicep delivering the power. So when I'm here, I can deliver that quite quickly, and I can at any point choose to turn it into a spike, or I can choose to use that spike on the side of the temple, the side of the jaw, right across the face like this. And so those are very simple drills. The arm is often referred to also as being a triangle with three points of movement. So from there, as I'm moving into my hammer or my hook, I can start to look if I can go from hand to elbow to hand. And this is a great way of changing the rhythm. I'm just using a sternum for durability. So very, very basic mobility drills that allow us to move quite naturally through the arm. This is all derivative from traditional Kazakh shashka or saber work, where the saber would be used and sort of flayed to keep distance. And we see the direct translation to fist work. If you're, if you're working even in a sportive environment and you're boxing and you start just throwing in that hammer fist, if your rules permitted in your gym, you'll see a massive difference in how quickly you score and you'll interrupt the pattern of the other person. So again, a basic combination. We go for a jab, whether with our knuckles or a pen, right into our hammer fist, sidestep and hook. And that's a basic, right in there. Or we can go from our fist to our elbow, back to our hammer. And again, that allows a very, very fast transition, overwhelms their nervous system, and gets you in, all while using only one hand.
people always want to know how they can use improvised weapons to affect pressure points and vital points. Um, my opinion is that there are only few high probability points. Um, secondly, they're only really going to be usable in very specific contexts um, where there is a, 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 a more compliant degree of interaction or where the person is being passively resistant or mildly resistant. They're not usable usually in, in hugely dynamic fist swings. Um, and thirdly, they're generally only advisable by people of uh, superior experience that have some familiarity in the context or who certainly have professional obligations like law enforcement or security officers to minimize the amount of damage they're doing. This is not a go-to for a woman's self-defense program. It is not the most important thing to learn at the beginning. But for those of you that are interested, I will show you three or four of the most essentials. So here again, I'm using a kubatan. I'm going to be uh, showing you a few of the basics and some of the most common mistakes. Mandibular angle is a good one, uh, particularly for intervention from the back. It's good for removing people out of chairs. If you have somebody as a, as a bouncer, we often have people squatting in the bathroom doing drugs. This was a prime go to. The common failing in the mandibular angle is people will go to the void right behind the ear. If you push on yourself, you'll see there's a little divot under the ear. And while that can be painful, right below it, there's a little piece of kind of rubbery tendon. That's what you really want to go for. And we're pushing that up to the sort of proverbial third eye. We should make an anvil or a support here, an anchor, and we push right in there. As soon as we get into a tool like this, like a Kubaten. It's very dangerous and there's a high, propens uh, high probability of dislocating the jaw. I've dislocated the jaw twice using uh, jaw pressure points. Very, very painful and uh, it falls in that domain of excessive force even though they're natural accidents. So really be careful about shearing along the side of the jaw. You don't want to do this. You want to really push up and to the center. Something as mildly fluted as this can start to really cause damage in the tissue and perforate the tissue, not necessarily the skin. Um, so do be cautious. But that's mandibular angle. If I trace under the jaw and I move literally, a good way to find it is the outside of the eye to the crevasse in the jaw, not on the outside where the optical nerve is, but literally under. Under and up like this. This is the hypoglossal nerve. Hypoglossal, I often use from the front just with fingers to lift somebody up. Again, if you have somebody squatting on the floor, when we teach the Coast Guard, it's one of the primaries for taking stowaways that are, you know, you're seeing them head first in funnels or in, or in long cavities. It's very, very good for pulling people even out of air shafts, things like that. Um, straight up like this, or it can be used, you can lift and, and drive in here. Removing somebody from a mounted position. So I said that, yes, we do. If somebody's mounted on somebody and you're coming from behind, I have choice of many mandibular angle or hypoglossal. I like to brace it with my thumb and I'm literally driving the tip as if it was going parallel to his jaw up to his temple. And so I'm going to usually keep my thumb here so that it doesn't go inward towards the trachea for his safety. And I'm going to brace the outside like that. And it's very little pressure. It kills. You feel it right up the side of the eye. So mandibular angle, not the divot, right underneath. Hypoglossal, following the inside contour of the jaw, not going towards the middle tissue. A third one, absolutely essential, we've covered it in previous DVDs, is the natural nostril. And the natural nostril is the notion that I pull the nose aside and I apply pressure into the skull hole where the nostril would be. When I work with the pen, and I, or the, the cubitan, I just put mild pressure. This is already like dentistry on the face. Yeah, it's brutal. Um, I can also use the top here and just push that nose over or pull like I'm paring an apple. It takes very, very little force, um, but they're excellent, excellent for moving people, particularly that one. The mandibular angle and the natural nostril are good for people in semi-lucid states. In fact, mandibular angle is widely used in the military. If you have somebody feigning uh, unconsciousness or death, Normally, we'll address them from the feet. We'll talk about this in our restraint DVD, but how to move the feet and to see if the person's moving. But if they're absolutely catatonic, mild pressure. Uh, military guys will sometimes use the tip of their knife, but any pressure with uh, even a gun barrel, hot gun barrel, or with uh, something sharp, even your thumb, will normally cause the eye to flutter, even if that person's almost comatose. So it's a good way of seeing if someone's dead or not, or if they're faking. If the, you put a little bit of pain, sometimes they'll start screaming and jump up and immediately drop the charade. So great, great, great pressure points, mandibular angle, hypoglossal, and natural nostril. Again, only really advisable for security professionals or those that have the extra level of skill and want to make the choice of minimizing harm, but uh, a very good set of points to have in your toolbox nonetheless.
Now I would like to discuss the idea of breaking structure in the human body and the notion of three planes of movement. If you stand up, and you are likely in a, in a square room right now, but if you imagine yourself in a cube, your body is capable of making rotations or circles on three surfaces. We have the walls in front of us and behind us, so I can make, for example, a circle with my arm on what's termed our frontal plane. We have the walls to our side, which is what's termed our horizontal, or, pardon me, our medial plane, and then we have circles right, on the ceiling and the floor, which is what we term our horizontal plane. The human body, when we think of it, oftentimes we, you know, most people go to break structure and they try to break it front to back on what's termed the medial plane. But the reality is if you think of elite athletes and you think of the way the human body is able to spin and maintain balance at the highest level, it is actually on the horizontal plane. If you think of uh, a figure skater, for example, they can spin tremendously fast, tremendously balanced on a very, very small spot or a dancer on the horizontal plane, far easiest. Second would be the medial plane, not first. The medial plane would be a shoulder roll or a front flip. You might have somebody who can do one or two back flips in a row, but they'll never match the power of a horizontal or axial rotation. And then finally, we'd have the frontal, like a cartwheel. And if you really look at somebody doing parkour, for example, or acrobatics, it's very rare they'll do that frontal plane rotation and stay purely on that plane. Normally, they'll pike and twist to the axial plane and have a horizontal spin in there to get the power. Why this matters is that when I attack somebody with an improvised weapon, there is usually amplified pain, and there's always a lot of fear and surprise. If somebody doesn't see the pen in your hand, you give them a little tap, and they start to bleed, people will often panic, especially with cosmetic injuries to the to the forehead or, or actual damage to the eyes. People will start to panic and move away, and they'll rarely back up straight. It's very rare, unless the person's quite drunk or stoned, that they'll move back like this. Normally, they'll cower to the side, and so as a result, when we start to cause that pain, breaking structure will require us to rotate the body and then usually bring them back on the medial plane. So as a basic preparation for your mind, any damage that you cause to that face, for example, is likely to cause them, if they're not ready for it, to turn away. If they're more skilled, they might change levels, and then we're looking at a grappler who's looking to shoot in, but again, affectation is still going to be on that axial plane. We're always looking to turn that face away from us and to steer the wholeness of the spine using the weapon or using our hands. Another thing that we want to revisit from our previous DVDs is that the spine is, com is composed of three fundamental arches. We have the cervical arch of the neck, the thoracic arch of the back, and the lower lumbar arch in the lower back. When I'm looking to apply leverage to somebody, I don't want to brace those arches. Common mistakes are people will grab the neck when trying to cause pain to the neck, grab the shoulder when trying to break the thoracic arch, or brace the lower back when trying to buckle someone backwards. You will have far more mechanical advantage if you work at the collar, the bra strap, and the belt. I want to have it right at the base of that lever so when I apply pressure, the wholeness of that lever gets affected and I amplify my force. So even if I just apply the lightest of pressure with the pen into the eye, for example, and I drive, huge effect. If I try, for example, I spike into the neck and I want to push, you see Anthony's natural response is to curve away on that horizontal plane. If I brace him on the shoulder, I'll block my own power. But if I just stop him below the shoulder blade, that's going to break that structure far easier. And if I do want to work against the lower back, I'm a big fan of gripping that belt so that when I, let's say, I work into the supersonal notch into the neck, if I drive him down, it's the easiest way to put them down. To learn this, you simply want to study where your hands naturally fall and look to make sure we're not in the habit of bracing those arches. It's a very simple thing to correct, but it just does take some repetition. Grabbing the collar, grabbing the mid skin or the shirt, or grabbing the belt are three easy ways to fix it. And those fulcrums don't need to be resistant. They simply need to be present. Usually I'm going to cause all the damage with the spike and push the person over, or the arm, push the person over with the second arm and then drive in. So again, the human body, three planes of movement, pain is likely to cause them to cower and turn away. Anticipate that, ride it, and then take them back on the medial plane. Make sure you brace the bottom of those three arches and you'll massively amplify your power and your success in taking them down. Some improvised weapons are particularly useful for quick disposal and throwing uh, in order to create a distraction. Um, again, going back to my intro, I've seen people advocating throwing the keys, right? So you throw your keys and then you run to your car and presumably break through the window and hotwire yourself in or you're climbing through your bathroom window to get into your house. I'm not quite sure what the logic is. Uh, naturally, we wouldn't throw keys. We wouldn't throw something of value. Something like a pen, assuming it's not a $200 Mont Blanc that you're going to weep after if you throw, um, is 
very, very easy and simple thing to throw. When throwing an item, two things are essential. The first is I prefer not to have a massive telegraphic action, unless I'm doing it intentionally as a fake and then moving in with the pen. So some people will use it like that, big motion, then move in with the pen anyway. If I am throwing it, generally, I'm going to have the pen in a very submissive, casual kind of posture, and I'm going to use the pen. I'm going to get the pen in a line with the target that I'm looking for, and I'm going to release it by flicking my wrist. I won't release it towards the camera, but rather than having this, I now have that. So it's a natural action. It's hidden in my gesture. I'm talking, I'm trying, and then I throw from there. So again, rather than this... I'm looking to simply be at a range where I can encroach. If I throw, I'm making this a natural extension of my body, and I flick it from the wrist as a natural action. So that's one, non-telegraphic. Number two, we don't want to throw and then run exactly in the memory lane of where he last saw me. Because if he flinches, he's going to swing to where he last saw me. If I collide with that fist, it's all on me. Yeah? So instead, what I want to do is release that pen and take one springing step off the side and then come in with whatever weapon of choice, an elbow or a form. So I'll be up, I'll release, and I'll drive through. So again, I'm usually only going to use this if I need that element of surprise. It's already clear to me there's no other way out. I have to be preemptive. I'm going to take that pen, blend it into my natural casual blur, my natural gesture. As I'm talking, I'm here. I throw it by flexion, releasing it in line with the target, step off the line, and spring into that target. Now we're going to move on to a more intermediate to advanced drill. If you are serious about carrying any item and you're going to have it readily available like a pen, uh, you want to be as comfortable with that as possible. One of the things we see when we start training offensive knife or offensive gun is that people use it like some foreign object and it's not a natural extension of their body. Even something as common as a pen, when we turn to weaponizing it, can sometimes be uncomfortable. So. I always tell my students, if you're going to carry it and you're going to fidget with it anyway, at least educate your fidget. So some of the basic ways we can move it. Obviously, we can switch it from hand to hand very naturally and comfortably while we're talking. But we also use the exact same techniques we use for offensive blade work. And the notion here is that under conditions of stress, I may lose fine motor skill. And so what happens is when people try to reach from hand to hand, they trip and they miss, right? They, they sort of lose it and they drop it. The example I always give is the Olympics. You have the best athletes in a country with the best resources, training all day along with the best coaches to do something as simple as run and pass a baton. And yet when they get there, some of them trip. Why? Because we don't rise to the occasion, but rather we fall to the level of our training. Stress and pressure aren't going to miraculously enhance your performance. They're not going to add something to it that wasn't there. They're going to take away from it. So we want to have the highest possible passing grade, the highest probability movements beforehand, so that we can afford to have the largest amount of deduction and deterioration and still be functional. If they can trip in the Olympics, we can miss passing something as simple as a pen when we're really nervous and shaking. So one of the keys that we use is what's known as proprioception, or our awareness of our body in space. If I get drunk, one of the first proprioceptions you lose is this. Right? And if you look at a lot of traditional Slavic dancing, like Greek dancing, they have a lot of body touching and heels as they get progressively drunk as part of that game to measure how they can sort of feel where their body is in space as their senses erode. When I pass a blade, rather than just going from hand to hand, we're always in the habit of touching the elbow and strafing down to give our body more information and more awareness about where that item is. And exactly the same way, if I have to pass my pen, I at minimum want to touch my forearm and slide. This not only will give us more information and make us less likely to drop it, it also blends into casual action much more readily. I can have the pen in one hand, cross my arms, and I don't want to come out and then try to jump to it, but I just, I use my body as a natural extension. So that if I'm talking with somebody, almost like a good magician doing sleight of hands, I don't want to get in the habit of passing it from hand to hand like this, I want to use my body. I want to use all elements of my arms to sort of enhance my information. And the second way is to use the body literally, to switch from, a, from an ice pick grip to an orthodox. So these are two very simple drills that I can do as I'm talking and moving. I can do this while holding a conversation with somebody. They won't even notice that the hands are switching. You can practice keeping it on the body and hiding it. If I have a cover shirt and I've taken it out from underneath, I can practice moving it underneath my cloth and holding it there so that when I access it, people aren't sure what hand it's coming out in. So these are very, very simple ways to pass the time that will enhance your manual dexterity that also have direct tactical application in higher level encounters.
system. So as you've already gathered from my introduction and previous mentions, I am not an advocate of uh, weaponizing the keys between the fingers, because I believe that's going to cause more damage to me as a wielder than give me any advantage over him. I'd far rather use my actual thumb or knuckles to create damage. It's far more familiar. Um, you know, one of the main reasons people use improvised weapons is that it gives them psychological empowerment. And a lot of people walk around with that notion that the key is going to be amazing. It's going to be that odds evener that's going to give them the upper hand. If they never get tested, then they can walk around with that delusion and be fine. If it makes them feel safer at night walking home, more power to them. But as soon as you pressure test it a little bit, and I invite you to do so, the damage falls onto you. And whatever damage I would accidentally create on my attacker, I'm confident I could more than create with a thumb tip or a finger or a knuckle. So I don't believe in using the keys as a weapon. I believe we should learn to operate without the key. Because what is good is having the key ready. If this is my next door that I'm going through, whether it be my car, or my house. There's nothing wrong with having that key ready in my hand. Purse to go in the lock the way it should. If I'm nervous and I'm making a three minute walk down a dark street and I'm worried about being inter intercepted, I will have my key ready by all means. But what that means is that if the key should be ready and I'm not an advocate of using it as a tool, I don't want to snap it, then I should learn how to use the rest of my body without, of it, without using it. So if we take something as simple as a Trinity shot, obviously I could just use my free hand. Right? If I have something in one item, another advantage of the Trinity shot is it allows me to provide significant amounts of variety and damage using my free hand. But even if I was obliged, if I was being held and I was obliged to use this hand, I could now choose to punch, elbow, I could hammer without ever needing to use that key. Work with the elbows, the forearms, the knees, the head, the other elbow and move and so forth. So as simple as this drill sounds, if you don't train it, you can't reliably expect to do it. So I always advocate if you do have keys and you ever find yourself holding the key at the ready when you're on part of your path, train yourself to have that key in your hand and simply work on a punching bag, delivering everything else that you can without needing to use the key. If at some point you find yourself giving a little sort of chicken jab with the key as an extra, as a natural expression, and it's working and you're not putting tons of pressure on it, or in this case my key is padded, it's got a ninja star on it so you know it's going to be deadly, uh, and it's not hurting me, then by all means you can do it, but I do not advocate turning this into some magic weapon that's going to save you, because it is not. Learn to function despite having them at the ready in your hands, you'll be far better off. The next item we are going to look at is the flashlight. So a flashlight, especially a small handheld flashlight, can be used in the exact same manner as a pen. Um, they have a little bit more weight, a little bit more heft when you hit with them, they'll amplify your fists, they're fantastic for hammer fists. Even a one dollar flashlight from the dollar store will have some striking value, but I strongly recommend getting just a basic tactical flashlight. Tactical flashlights are normally defined as being slightly more durable, um, they'll often have faceted surfaces so that if you put them down they won't roll away from you, which is never something you'd want. Um, they'll often have various settings which can include a stroke, like this, and strobes are basically looking for 65 lumens of light power or above in any flashlight so that it'll cause some kind of a pattern interrupt in the individual. This one is uh, 400 lumens, so it's more than enough when you, you get that in the eyes to sort of start affecting you. So when I use a flashlight, a good tactical flashlight will also have kind of either a beveled or spiked edge. This one is slightly serrated, so it gives you a little bit more gouge. Glass is high shatterproof resistance. I can drive even lightly, and you feel that. It's brutal, these little marks on them. You hit somebody in the face with that, it's cutting them open huge concussive power. Technique doesn't need to be complicated, a simple shot. I can go into all that Slavic boxing. I can do the Slavic boxing with the flashlight on for added advantage, or different flashlights have different settings. Some of them will have the ability to stay on constantly. Some of them will have the ability to go off so there's no accident. This one has a strobe. And then this one also has touch, and touch is the easiest for control. But even if I have a basic flashlight that stays on all the time, I can work at just moving it like this to create something similar to a strobe effect. So all we're looking to do now when we work, one added tactic for a flashlight is the idea of drop baiting. Drop baiting is a boxing concept, and the idea is that if I'm standing in front of somebody, rather than simply punching where the hands are, I keep my item fixed, move away from it. In ordinary boxing context, the idea is that I bait him towards me and then I drive him from where he's not expecting it. But if I now put a light up as I move, the person fixates on the light and doesn't see the shot coming in from the other side. So the two most basic drop baits are light up and on, 
as I step away and deliver power. In exactly the same way we did when throwing an item, springing off the line and going in. The only thing I need to do is try not to move with. I'm gonna, I can have that flashlight on if I'm nervous about it. It's more of a tactical scenario, I'm clearing my house and I can keep it muffled against my chest, pop it up and drive out. The second way I can do it is by popping it up and changing levels. This is often done with firearm work or with if I have a secondary weapon, but I pop it up and I drive through. So again, light comes up, move off the line. Right? As that light comes up, move off the line, either going lateral or dropping below, drop baiting. Okay guys, now we are going to delve into the world of flexible weapons. Uh, flexible weapons come in many shapes and forms. They can be everything from a belt to a scarf to a, scarf, to a rope to a jacket or a shirt. We're going to begin with belts and belt-like items. Um, the first item that we're going to be talking about is just your conventional belt. The one thing I do not advocate is trying to access the belt in the context of the fight. I've seen many schools teaching all sorts of complex, quick, you know, sort of removals in the context of the fight. I think if you, if you see you have 10, 15 seconds to prepare yourself, you can take it off, you're against the knife, by all means you can do it. Doing it in the midst of some kind of fisticuffs I think is a ridiculous idea, my experience, my opinion. Secondly, I know this is, should be self-evident, but if your pants can't stand without your belt, don't take it off, right? You look for something else like a scarf or a jacket or a shirt. When holding a belt, um, one of the first things we don't want to do, we have a fairly rigid leather belt here. Some people will advocate keeping the buckle out as a whipping item, and that's fine if you've trained it and you're very comfortable, because when that item comes around there is going to be tremendous power, and we'll talk about whipping a little bit later on. Uh, there are definitely ways of absorbing it. If you're less comfortable, I suggest keeping the buckle down because this will give you something you can you can scratch and hit with at close range hammer fisting and there's less damage to yourself when you're when you're flailing and whipping. It also slows the speed down a bit. Um, you can simply hold that belt in a hammer fist position with that buckle at the bottom. If you are prone due to the length uh, or comfort to wrap, I don't generally advocate and I was not taught to ever wrap straight like this because there's always a risk if somebody grabs and starts pulling that it snags or sometimes the, the buckle will get caught and it can kind of winch your hand uh, quite significantly and be painful. It may not necessarily get stuck permanently. With something like chain, there's a far higher risk. A far safer way to grip is not to put it between the L thumb weave, but rather to put it on the outside of your thumb fat. And so what I do is I essentially use my fingers in a monkey grip all together to grip it, and then I will wrap around my wrist to brace it, and then pass it through my thumb weave. If I want to keep this as an extra striking tool, I have it, but what's far more important now is I get all of the retention advantage I had before, but if somebody pulls on it, it releases far more readily. And it's something that becomes quite, quite comfortable to do um, with, with the item. If I'm using something like a scarf, for example, a longer scarf, generally, if I have the time, I'm going to double it up. It's the same thing, right? When I have a tool like this, if I start wrapping it around my hands, it can snag on itself quite easily, and then sometimes you get caught. We've even had people break fingers in their in, in training environments. So it's far preferable to grab it outside the thumb. Again, it's almost like a Spider-Man position, holding that in place, and then wrapping it up through your web. It gives you all of the retention. There's no ratcheting on the hands when you pull, and you release very, very quickly. So that's fundamental. That's basic gripping. A general caveat before getting into weapons, I'm going to be focusing primarily on using uh, something softer like a rope like this, not because it's, uh, it's, it's something you're generally going to have, simply because it'll be easier for you to see it on my clothing, and it's a lot less injurious than this. So when we're doing simple snapping or whipping actions with this, uh, be advised. I will show sometimes with the belt. The belt causes a lot of damage. If you do use this in training, please be careful. Even with fully armored helmets, um, a light slap with a non-buckled end at full speed, if it hits halfway into the neck, there's a lot of damage. If it wraps slightly around the head and the head gets ratcheted, there can be damage to the brain. And just getting it through the helmet, it's its a whip. It's massively uh, compounding the power that you would have in a normal strike. We recently did a seminar using only lightweight martial arts belts at half length cut and the whipping damage people were causing on each other you know was, was ridiculous we had to slow them down so for the uh, for the purposes of safety and simplicity I'll be using generally either the soft scarf or the rope but if you do train with a leather belt or a, a nylon web belt especially they cut very easily please be safe please respect your partner when you're training
So going back to those fundamental principles of learning to function within the weapon's capacity, and then secondly, despite having it, we generally begin by having the weapon in, a, in the shortest grip possible. If it is a short belt or a short scarf, you might begin in this length. If it's something far longer, I recommend doubling it at first and learn control. Um, one of my biggest grievances in the domain of improvised weapons can be found in flexible weapon training. You will commonly see these kinds of sort of, you know, generally static drills, people using the, you know, flexible weapon to create deflections and then some kind of complex snare going underneath. I did, and we certainly had these kinds of techniques in, in styles of jiu-jitsu that I did where you strip it and the knife is supposed to go flying. We certainly had it in Cali, we had it in Silat. In my experience, this is suicide. When a knife, even if a knife is static and I was able to get around and had that much time, the probability is they're gonna flinch and retract and cause grief and damage to me. If they're coming in like a sewing machine, there is nobody in my life that I've seen that would be capable of doing this, this kind of work. I think as an art form, as cultural appreciation, there may be value, but I think as a high probability self-defense skill that it's at best delusional and at worst extremely dangerous. So you will never see me doing any sort of complex scenario like that. Um, what I far rather teach at the beginning is simply having it firmly gripped with two hands and learning first that I can still function with the remainder of my body. And generally we'll go through a number of phases where we'll try to isolate straight punches, then straight punches and hammer fists, then elbows. We can even work shortening that grip so that it's almost as if I'm handcuffed and we will even work handcuffed in front so that I learn to enhance my empty handed work first, learning to operate despite the weapon many phases of training just there. Then, when I do start to include the weapon, the most basic strike that we'll use is a simple snap. And it's quite simple. We'll usually use it either against an arm as if we were deflecting, or against the throat, which will usually be represented as a vertical forearm. So the easiest thing to remember here is that when you grip it, you're gripping it however you feel comfortable, and we're generally getting past the target with the hands before we add the snap. So I don't want to snap on the surface. That's only a skin cosmetic sort of shock. I want it to deeply push through. This is the softest, lightest cotton rope that you can possibly have. If I go back to that belt again, just to make one comparison, just that, and we have the arm. Even on the surface, it hurts. When you start pushing through, there's far more weight. After four or five, the arm starts to get blemishes. So again, we would normally be doing it with something like that or like a nylon tactical belt, but for safety, for longevity of the students so you can train, uh, train and have much more reps, we're just gonna use something light and soft. So again, we're normally going through. I wanna have a good structure. My frame is there. I'm not leaning into the tool, but rather I'm dropping with my body like this. If it's a vertical target, emulating the throat or even the eyes or the face, be cautious. This is this is your replacement target. Place yourself off to an angle so that there's no risk of me accidentally striking him in the face as I go, right? I'm looking to go past the target and then extend. And just like I don't want to hit him accidentally in the face with my hand, I also don't want him to hit himself with the hand. I sure as hell don't want to wait and stay right in the zone and get that coming back to me. So when the hand is up, if I move you more to camera, what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to make sure that I'm striking this away from his head, but I'm also moving myself out of that zone, right? So my hands are coming through and I'm driving up like this. Again, I would never use this as some kind of a block against an ice pick stab. I would never use this as anything other than a straight strike, usually to the neck or sometimes flossing into the face. Gross motor, simple, universal entry, driving down sometimes to check an arm if it's trying to access something or driving into the neck or into the face. Power generation is the only thing that matters here. Good structure, not leaning, keeping a loaded stance, moving forward, moving my hands past the target as I add that snap. And you will cause more than enough damage. Again, when we pressure test this in helmets, People get so dazed, you gotta watch them from falling down. It's a high risk of knockout, even in a helmet. We never do this full force in training. Continuing with this notion of learning to operate despite having it, um, we can start by having the, the scar for the belt in one hand and simply revisit all of those structure breaks that we did before. So very often we'll just have our subject standing and we'll come up to them and study whatever it is that we have in our existing arsenal for putting someone down. So I'm doing it without any relationship to the belt. The belt is in my hand, I put them down, I study, and then I get it ready either to hit or I go to a secondary weapon. So that would be 
usually be a preliminary phase. After that, we can have the person simply pushing me, right? And as they push, we go back to our basic yield drill, and they're pushing as much as possible. And within the context of that work, I look for whatever's comfortable. But again, the whole notion in the Russian approach is that I don't want to get excited. So as he keeps pushing me, he keeps pushing as I talk, I'm just yielding with the body, and I'm looking to see how I can just go through it. You know, they commonly use expressions like butter and toast or chewing gum. So there's no part of the belt that is required. I'm really learning to operate despite. He'll push, I may not even see where it's coming from. And I get ready. So that is a very compliant, what we term soft work. It's preparation for the subject to soften the body. It's preparation for the other individual to learn how to fall. But for me, it's much more about learning to not judge the technique, not looking for that one perfect move. It could be the messiest thing in the world, and I just, I take him down, and I ready myself. Once that's comfortable, you can look at even limiting yourself by it, as if we're cuffed by it. So he can go for any type of lock, and during the motion of the lock, I simply... And I start to slip out and use the belt as a tool. I can use it as a lever. Again, without any specificity or... I can use it just as a, as a basic control. I can use it to double grip or single-handed. So we naturally extend from there. So again, it's more of a free play drill. Uh, one of the things that was first expressed to me is that if you look at animals in the wild, when they prepare their young for the most important thing they'll encounter, which is a fight to the death, they never line them up in rows or you know make them memorize specific patterns. Animals play. They simply play to discover potential. When we train, it's very, very much important that we learn to just be in the moment, to adapt to what's there without judgment, and to simply use the weapon or not use the weapon uh, when it's appropriate in the context. Now, although free play is a central component of what we do, some degree of specificity is always required. Um, rather than look at enforcing our desire or our ideals, we always look at what does manifest in pressure testing. And what does come out consistently in our experience are simple gross motor head wraps, either around the nape or across the front. And if we revisit those basic snapping attacks we did either to a horizontal forearm or across the throat, the exact the same sort of concepts apply here. We can simply start by having somebody extend an arm like a zombie and learn how we can navigate around it in exactly the same way we did with the pen. I could use a hammer fist and strike through. I could use my wrist and forget the tool entirely. Or I could look at hooking and contouring through. In these positions, if we go back to the arch work we did earlier, I stop them either at the base of the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar arch. I can work despite having the belt, where the belt's not in any way involved. I can work using the length of the scarf to assist and give me a little bit of torque. Or if I go to a low arch, or if I have a less of a length, as I move down in order to reach the belt, now I'm pushing it, and the belt itself becomes an added uh, sort of lever. So again, at any of those arches, I learn despite having the belt, and then if it does get included, it's a bonus. Um, the most basic traps that we see are across the nape, and if we imagine, if I just get Anthony to fist out the arm like that, if I go around the back of the nape, I can choose to just pull, but I can also choose to add snap, like that. That kind of a snap, I'm gonna go very, very light on the back of the neck, horrifying. Very, very dangerous for the vertebrae very dangerous for the lenses of the eyes, not so good for the brain. So we want to be really careful. It doesn't matter what helmet he puts on, teeth are knocking together, brain is swishing all over like the family Doberman. You want to be very careful. You're going to go right through the windshield. you got to be very, very cautious when you do this work. Nothing too hard in your training. Gentle, even pulls. If I look at choking, we'll get into the specifics of blood chokes a little bit later on, but the only thing I don't want to do is clash with my fabric. So generally I'm going to have a downward pulling side and a cross moving side. And if I'm looking to just provide a quick choke or a quick hit, my straight pulling side will normally be high and I will punch it under. And so I'll go whoop, like this. What in effect happens is that the cloth starts to displace the trachea a little bit. Like that. Right? It strikes into that brachial junction and it gives you great leverage. So that cross push is more for stumbling and stunning and that long portion is more for pulling and taking down. And you can keep the snare, you can abandon that, you can go to your stomps, your hits as you wish. So again, basic rear snare, I can again use all my head and arms and limbs that I had before, but the most basic snap down here, or a cross grip into that position. 
If I work from the front, the same thing applies. As I go across the, the throat, I can extend with a little snap here. And I can do that simply to push him back, or I can do that to push him into a structure break. So very, very simple, gross motor. Again, we're not looking to impress with complexity. We're looking to say consistently, after decades of training, what comes out almost all the time for most people. These are the easiest traps that we've seen. They're reliable, they're effective. In real circumstances, they've worked for myself and my students. Around the nape, simple shrug and pull, or across the front, depending on context, relative height, size, and resistance. I really do prefer to keep my work as simple as possible, um, but I will show a few intermediate examples that uh, have been very good for me and that uh, often work for, for students that have a bit of an established base. Um, so we saw in the previous phase that the simple wrap around the back or simple wrap around the front is usually the most accessible and easiest. But sometimes, depending on context, you might find your arm is in position first and we can reverse wrap the head. And so the idea here is instead of going in straight like we're holding bicycle handlebars, I'm going to punch past as if I'm going through the face and then reverse wrap here. Now the advantage of this one is that I have all the snaring power of cloth, but now I have my radial edge, my thumb edge of my forearm up into the neck. So that gives you a much harder choking surface. And as I pull, that's more likely to cause them again to rotate on that axial plane. I can still go for what I did before, which is pulling across and pulling down, much, much tighter uh, choke. And some people will even cross grip like that. Not to necessarily abandon, but simply to hold that as an extra, as an extra sort of uh, form of tightness. The idea here is that even if somebody's behind me, I can whip over and I can use it like this. If you've ever done gi work, for example, I can choke straight up like this, but I can also cross reach and pull down. And so this is a very natural extension of that style of work or a sambo uh, sort of kurtka choke. So again, we're punching past the body, pulling this over the back, and then driving that down. Once I'm in position now, a few little subtleties that'll make it worse or better, I can look at motorbiking that over. And you see, if I just keep my, my, my left arm, in this case, solid, as I do this, the ratcheting action drives that in almost like a tourniquet. I can also look at ratcheting and then wrapping this to get rid of any risk of slip like this. So if I'm using this, holding somebody, for example, in a car with a seatbelt, this kind of work can often happen because you can cross grip the seatbelt so you see, if you imagine a seatbelt, I can cross grip, and I can pull it over the top like this and start to work like that. So it's primarily my, 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 my sort of wrist and hand working. I can do the same work cross gripping a shirt and pulling the back as well. T-shirts far, far, far more uh, sort of flimsy and flexible. We'll see a little bit later on, they tear quite easily. So oftentimes I'll rely more on my wrist. But for the base belt choke with this, we cross reach, over wrap. That can be a hard pull. I can lever with my elbow. I can drive that wrist upward as well like this on a flexion to get into the trachea, and at any point I can punch release and go back to my strikes. So that's a reverse wrap neck trap. The next one's fairly self-evident, guys. We're just going to flow through some basic ideas for close quarter striking. Um, again, what matters is not that it's cognitively understood, it's that we train it, right? The simplest thing in the world, like a jab in boxing, cognitively understood very, very easily, but it needs to be trained. So once we do get into this basic snare, what we like to look at is how can we work from here with our strikes? The most overlooked and simplest strikes are the close range hands. Now, people will typically in this position think of always punching and relinquishing the grip, which is fine, but if you keep these as tight as possible and look instead at working with my elbows, my elbows can be delivered a few different ways. I can deliver an elbow like a, a wing, right, where I'm actually impacting with the softer surface, like this, right? It's not going to be a cutting elbow, it's not going to be a, a sharp surface, but it's going to be a very heavy concussive force that will allow me to strike not only without relinquishing my grip like a punch might require, but actually while adding grip. I can tug, tug and hit at the same time. If I have the length, I can look at, or if I, if I switch my grip over from this sort of cow milking grip to a reverse ice pick grip, I can look at elbowing anywhere to the back of the head, base of the jaw, mandibular angle, right? I can cross grip and relinquish one hand to hit into my elbows. And I can also work, people often overlook this one, but keeping good tension on the back of the neck, I can work rather than doing an uppercut, which risks hitting me in the phalanges, right in the weak part of the fingers on a jawbone, which is not a good exchange. I work on hitting with that elbow straight up into the jaw or the neck, or even going across and doing all the same work we did with our cross forearm, reverse wrap choke, using just the elbow. And that's tremendous leverage for throws or basic sweeps. So again, we can punch here. 
I could even do micro work with the thumb into the trachea, but generally we recommend keeping that tension down and looking at how can I hit with the elbow? How can I switch the grip and hit with the elbow? How can I come inside with the elbow? driving up and keeping that tension at all times. And a final one that's essential is the head spear. I can obviously drive a shot in and keep working, but I can likewise keep the head in as I pull and drive to the space and then clear out and go into my strikes. So again, we like to learn to work despite having the weapon, but if we are gonna use it, we wanna maximize it. So there's no value in putting a trap and then striking in a way where the trap is giving you nothing. Sistema literally means the system, and as I mentioned earlier, it is really a, a sort of consistent, interrelated series of parts. We want to fight one way in all domains. So if we go back to one of our most basic entry locks that we saw with the pen and that we've seen in other DVDs, this notion of the underhook and pike, nothing should really change if we have cloth. Best way to start is have cloth between our hands of a, of a significant sort of expanse by the, you know, take an average belt size, that kind of expanse. If I work against the arm and move in, this belt is not really required, but it will provide a little bit of extra control and torque across the front of the shoulder, purely incidental. The underhook and pike is just such a high probability and effective move even against large and resistant people because it allows us to get in there quite easily. Moreover, people are going to resist going to the floor more powerfully than anything you can fathom. So if I I can, rather than drive them onto their face, invite them from this position simply to sit down. The underhook and pike is probably the most agreeable way to do that, right? It's, it, it gives them time to think, to see where they're going, and it ultimately spirals them towards their hips rather than towards their face or their free hand. When I do perform the underhook and pike, Again, I'm fighting the deltoid, looking for that slap down. I can drive in with this. Some people will just drive in with the, with the wrist edge, again, weaponizing the arm rather than the belt, into the neck. And then from that position, what I'm looking to do is create elongation to pull that away. I can absolutely use my thumb into the nerves of the neck to give a little bit more power. I can drive a few non-telegraphic knees into the low line. The key to the underhook and pike is that I don't want to simply spiral the arm and the head. Because if I do, the person will usually twist out the other side. And although I have a belt, it's not really giving me anything. If you look at that, there's no trap there. So what I'm looking to do is get his head to 6 o'clock, get his elbow or his arm roughly to noon.